Tanse, Nito Dimtek, Tan Esperanto, Nitsigasan, Naya Apitawi Gosisan, Zegitawak Nitsotsin. Hello, everybody. My name is Tan Esperanto. I'm a member of the Metis Nation of Alberta from Region 6 in Peace River, and um, I am the Events and Media Manager at the American Indian Community House, and here to welcome you to our food sovereignty presentation. The mission of the American Indian Community House is to improve and promote the well being of the American Indian community and to increase the visibility of American Indian cultures in an urban setting in order to cultivate awareness, understanding, and respect. AICH is a AICH is short for American Indian Community House, if you didn't know, is a 501c3 not for profit organization serving the needs of Native Americans residing in New York City. AICH was founded in 1969 by Native American volunteers as a community-based organization mandated to improve the status of Native Americans and to foster intercultural understanding. And I am now going to pass it over to my colleague, Tatiana Benali. Yes, everyone. My name is Tatiana Benali. I am from the Navajo Nation. Yaz e Sheya Tatiana Benali, Yanis Yes, Hotona Shan, and his Ejitatini Nishwen, Nashoshi Dine Bashitin, Kinpachini Dashite, Ado Bizani Dashinale. So just introducing myself for all the Dine relatives out there. <laughs> um, so I'm going to go ahead and read the mission statement for the women's gathering. So our intention with this women's gathering was to provide a space for any and all Native women, femme, non-binary, and transgendered relatives to offer relevant, informative, and art-related workshops in a space to gather and celebrate among one another. The gathering is two-day-long virtual sessions, so today and tomorrow, via Zoom um, due to the pandemic. The sessions are for us, by us, this year's theme being nurturing and grounding, including sessions on food sovereignty, like the one today, um, indigenous futurism, midwifery, caregiving, and women's health. And the result is to have our participants walking away feeling grounded in community with access to resources and strengthened in community as well. So I'll go ahead and hand it over to Emily to introduce yourself. Hello, everyone. Have My name is Emily Price. I'm a citizen of the Osage Nation. I'm a youth facilitator for today with um, AICH. And I don't know about you guys, but I'm very excited about today's presentation um, by Danielle Hill. So Danielle Hill is the founder of Heron Hill LLC, and she holds an MPA in sustainable development from the World Learning Graduate Institute. And in 2018, established her consulting business, Heron Hill LLC. She works in various capacities for tribal governments, tribal organizations, and Native American nonprofits consulting on a variety of indigenous issues. Danielle is also a student midwife and doula and is passionate about reviving indigenous birthing practices, promoting food sovereignty, indigenous farming, and maintaining Eastern woodland traditions. Danielle is also co-owner of the Wampanoag Trading Post and Gallery and a member of the Wampanoag Nation Singers and Dancers. As a citizen of the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe and raised in Mashpee all her life, she has witnessed many sightings of blue herons on Cape Cod, especially over the past few year years. However, more recently, almost a dozen have been found mysteriously dead on tribal lands in Mashpee. In many cultural mythologies, the heron symbolizes balance, self-reliance, and an ability to progress and evolve. Heron Hill LLC was formed to continue to raise awareness and appreciation of this great bird. Um, so she is going to lead us in a presentation about food sovereignty, followed by a question uh, and answer session. So there will be time for questions at the end, and you can add your uh, questions to the chat throughout the presentation, but they will be um, addressed at the end of the presentation. So without further ado, I would love to pass the baton over to Danielle. Oh, Katapatanamu. Thank you, everybody. Waninakan, uh, Natasawis Pamachuan. So my, my spirit name is Running Water. Um, I am also known as Danielle Hill. And most recently, I just got married. I'm now Danielle Green Deer. So thank you all. Um, I come to you from Mashpee. I'm sitting in the Wampanoag Trading Post and Gallery. 
Uh, we just opened in July. So that's my other passion besides food is art. Um, one day they will merge. Uh, we're working on a lot of food art uh, related projects. So we'll keep you guys posted. Um, but today I, I wanna put on my food sovereignty hat um, and just share with you some of my um, experiences, understanding uh, how food sovereignty is expressed throughout Indian country, what different tribes are doing um, and how they're creating their food sovereignty programs and um, how it just looks differently um, to different tribes. Um, but first I just wanna uh, take a moment and just say a quick prayer. Um, I always, before I start talking and um, you know, asking for essentially social change, I do wanna acknowledge um, just where we are at now and um, you know, all of those that have come before us. So I just wanna take a moment and put our minds together, take a quick breather and just uh, have a moment of gratitude. So I'm gonna say the prayer in the Wampanoag language. Um, so, Manatka, Nikonakuchik, Katapatanamu, Wachi, Wami, Tiakwasanish, Katapatanamu, Wachi, Kisak, Katapatanamu, Wachi, Anakwasak, Katapatanamu, Wachi, Aki, Sipuash, Katahanash, Awasak, Katapatanamu, Wachi, Wami, Natankwasak, Ananama, Anian, Namunat, Weepi, Wanikak, Anamana anian usinat wimpi sompuak. Aho. So basically, I just want to thank the creator for all of our animal and plant beings, the sky, the stars, the land, our waters. Um, thank you for all the creatures, all of our relations, and help us to see only what is right and help us to do what is right. So thank you. Um, let me just begin <clears throat> by saying. Um, I have worked uh, for a large Midwest tribe um, as their food sovereignty coordinator. Um, I have worked for a large native organization um, as their food systems consultant. And I have been working with a lot of uh, different tribes in the Pacific Northwest, as well as here on the East Coast um, with some of their food sovereignty grants doing grant management. And um, I have concluded that there are about five major areas where we can look at uh, food sovereignty and, and we can understand it um, from these five different perspectives. Um, and so the first uh, is about, well, first let me just, let me define food sovereignty. Okay, because let's just, let me just tell you what, what is out there. Um, as, as the official definition. Um, and so basically food sovereignty is the right of peoples to healthy and culturally appropriate food that's produced through ecologically sound and sustainable methods. And it's their right to define their own food and agricultural systems. Um, so in food sovereignty is a movement that's happening globally. Um, and it's, look, and it's uh, being expressed differently internationally than it is uh, domestically for tribal nations. So tribal food sovereignty is basically um, tribes defining their own food systems and controlling their access to their food systems. Um, sometimes that is uh, not easily done because many of these tribes are uh, geographically isolated. Um, there's a lot of economic barriers. Um, there's a lot of levels of poverty, um, you know, lack of access to education, just to basically understanding sort of the political landscape. So it's not um, that easily uh, accomplished, but we're collectively working towards it. Um, but the first thing we should do is just understand it. Uh, so my five um, aspects of food sovereignty, and I say that because it's not out there anywhere. It's just what I have observed as major categories. And so the first is about um, how they're controlling their food source. So um, their agricultural systems, their aquaculture systems, how they are, or if they are uh, farming, gardening, fishing, trapping, hunting, uh, gathering, shellfishing, um, seed saving, 
uh, if they have seed libraries, how are they sourcing their seeds? Are they growing um, non-GMO and heirloom seeds? Um, how are these tribes um, stewarding their own lands, preser preserving their own space, um, accessing and acquiring land specifically for the reason of growing out for their, their tribal members? Um, so it's all about, you know, how are they, besides going to the grocery store, what other ways are they acquiring food, preserving it, saving it? Um, and that's really important um, because you have to start somewhere. And um, if you want to define a tribal food economy, you have to see um, historically what the tribe did um, to source their food and then how it has changed uh, because of colonization or through development. Um, and so the second way would be um, looking through food sovereignty through a cultural lens. Um, so how their food fits into their specific culture, into their specific um, rituals or ceremonies or just day-to-day -day life, why they ingest certain things and um, how um, how they preserve their food ways, um, how they prepare their food ways. Um, historically, uh, is it written somewhere or is it, or is there oral tradition about um, the unique handling of food? Um, how they handled the animals um, when they uh, either, if they hunted or if they shellfished. Um, how are they cooking? Um, and of course, these things are all going to be uh, expressed differently because tribes are located um, differently throughout the nation. And, you know, there's different climates, there's different um, landscapes, um, but it's really important because if you want to evolve a food culture, you have to start with how they even look at food. Do they value food? Um, is it something that, um, for example, when I was out in the Midwest working for a tribe, um, there was only certain things that they ate um, that was sort of considered uh, special. And that was just during ceremonial time. Um, any other time, day to day, they wouldn't be um, eating these certain foods or cooking these certain foods this way. Um, so you have to see, you know, why is that? And a lot of the times these foods um, are just for nostalgic purposes. Um, so you have to sort of uh, work with the community and, and understand that um, and, and why they do that. And then how, um, how these tribes are, um, if, they're, if they're heavily relying upon uh, processed foods um, and how they're sourcing their foods, are they uh, spending a lot of their money at the local Walmarts or the local um, uh, stop and shops or grocery stores? Um, where else could they potentially get uh, healthy food um, and how else could they bring it into their day-to-day -day culture? Um, for example, um, are there certain foods or events that you could um, serve uh, traditional foods at? You know, how often can you do that just to start to influence the palate of the tribal members? Um, so that's, that's, um, just looking at it through a cultural context. Um, the third way would be the spiritual uh, component of, of food. So we all understand, most of us uh, agree that we are what we eat. And um, to me, this is the most important component of food sovereignty movement um, within Indian country. And it's about, it's about understanding that our, food um, is not, is being, is freed from this idea of just commodification, that we're just eating for taste. We're just eating to get full. Um, we're just eating to have a good meal. You know, I eat um, because I have to, you know, it's, it's removing that mindset and, and more about um, spiritually eating, you know, looking at um, these plants and these animals as being alive and understanding what, um, what properties these plants and animals possess, 
where they specialize in helping the body or the mind or the spirit, um, how they like to grow, um, you know, how they um, like to be cared for, um, and then and then ingesting these animals and these plants um, to essentially evolve um, our own spiritual evolution. And so many tribes due to colonization have been forced to eat commodity foods, um, foods that lack any level of nutritional uh, content um, for many, many years. And that's why you know, Native American communities face such high uh, health disparities, um, such high levels of diabetes. Um, and you know, it's no fault of their own, but it was just a means to an end to survive. Um, but essentially, many tribal people uh, and many Americans have been forced to eat dead food. Um, we are in a place right now within the food sovereignty movement of where we are encouraging one another and where we are encouraging tribes to start eating and looking at our food systems from uh, the perspective of like, this is about our spiritual evolution. Now we have to eat foods that are alive because when these foods come into our bodies, you know, and they're, and they're organically grown or they're non-genetically modified, um, it will affect and change our genetic DNA and it will affect and change, um, you know, our level of clairvoyance, our level of, um, of connection to the earth, to spirit. Um, so it's not just about eating healthy. Um, it's not just about eating locally. It's about supplying our food, or excuse me, supplying our body with the necessary um, spiritual nourishment that it needs. Um, we can go on and just be sort of stagnant in our evolution, um, but uh, it's time to sort of ascend. And the way to do that is 100% through our food um, and through these plant and these animals. That's why we're here. Um, we are not separate from uh, what it is that grows around us. We are not separate from the animals. I mean, that's something that we have been um, forced to believe um, is that we are stewards and we're separate from this, this uh, connection. Um, but I'm sure many of you have experienced it um, just by having a pet, you know, that there's levels of um, understanding that you can gain. And um, if we just focus our attention on that, um, with the plants that we eat and how we cultivate and care for them, then it would definitely change our mindset uh, with how we proceed and how we, how we move forward with our food culture. Um, so that's the third. Um, the fourth would be looking at food sovereignty through a political lens. Um, and politics is uh, key to a lot of these tribal nations uh, to them uh, gaining resources that they need to be successful. Um, so the first thing would be, um, what does their governmental structure look like? Um, are they uh, creating food policy councils? Are they creating food policy codes and laws within their tribal governments and in their tribal judicial systems? Um, how are they protecting maybe one of their cherished or all of their resources that they that they uh, deem to be special. For example, um, the White Earth Nation um, has passed a law to uh, respect the rights of wild rice. Um, and that is uh, the rights of nature movement. And that's integral to the food sovereignty movement. Um, because if we're asking and encouraging tribes to start large scale um, agricultural projects um, or aquaculture projects, they have to then also put in place the political uh, parameters that will protect these, um, these sentient beings. So um, if you're not familiar with the rights of nature, for example, it's saying, we understand that uh, rice um, is conscious and it chooses um, through its root systems, um, like many other plants, um, where it wants to grow, what other plants it wants to grow by, um, 
you know, and it moves consciously. Um, and we have to protect its uh, surroundings and we have to protect its environment. So that way we foster um, a, uh, a successful uh, breeding ground for these, these beings. And, and we as human beings are not, we don't have the right um, to destroy their environment with development or with our own um, self-interests. Um, and it's protected. And so that's extremely important. Um, and there, and wild rice so far is the only one um, that has been passed um, into law, but it would be nice to see other um, beans like corn, um, wheat, um, even out here, it would be so nice to have our, our waters and our certain waterways um, acknowledge to have rights so we can successfully grow out our shellfish and not have it um, be threatened because of overdevelopment and pollution in our waters. Um, so this to me, um, this uh, will give tribal nations a lot of teeth when it comes to advocating for what it is they want, advocating for resources. Um, this is, this um, will allow them to exercise their sovereignty in a very unique way and in a way that has never been done before. Um, just by simply adopting rights of nature codes and by simply um, creating food policy councils or food um, or agricultural uh, um, departments with food sovereignty um, uh, programs. Um, so this is a way that is looked at um, um, and can be, this can complement the other efforts um, in the different categories. This is uh, one that you would want to um, really uh, promote and develop in your tribal government. Um, and so the fifth one of how to look at uh, food sovereignty would just be through an economical uh, and societal lens. Um, so basically it's, it's does, do, do these tribes have um, the capacity to create food economies? Um, and, and within food economies, uh, you have food related businesses. Um, so are these, um, many tribes have, uh, for example, gas stations um, where they sell, of course, the typical gas station uh, food, but do they have the autonomy or the flexibility to uh, replace some of those uh, food products with more healthier options, um, ones that will actually benefit maybe tribal members. Can you just uh, put in on your shelf um, a, a local jam or jelly that's made from the choke cherries um, from maybe a collective uh, group of tribal members? So that way you're not just purchasing um, food from these big companies, um, but you're, you're, you know, providing an economic um, outlet and an incentive to tribal members. And so you're keeping the money circulating within your economy. Um, and so that's one way um, to also exercise sovereignty is how to keep the money flowing in your economy, you know, and, and food uh, products is something that's, um, that can be done easily. And there are grants out there through USDA. Um, there are ways to, uh, to um, promote your food culture without exploiting it, um, you know, but just um, providing um, more access to it, to your own people, you know. Um, so that is the five areas that I felt um, we're not really uh, categorized in the food sovereignty conversation, um, but I, I felt like that's just an easy way um, to wrap your head around this concept. Cause sometimes it can sound really obscure like development or sustainability. So food sovereignty is just a huge umbrella um, and we have to tackle it through these different, uh, these different perspectives or these different doors. Um, and so, that, that has led me um, to help others and other organizations and just individuals um, with how they can get involved in the food uh, sovereignty movement. Um, you know, what can you do as an individual 
Um, if you're far removed from a tribe um, or if you're not native, you know, what can you do to support? And so basically um, there's some just real practical ways. Number one, um, through the website indianag.org, um, you can absolutely just um, uh, see a list of providers um, of native food companies. And you can uh, purchase these foods, whether it be the wild rice or um, the Indian corn or the choke cherry jams. Those were real actual uh, products that exist. Um, you know, you can purchase those directly from these tribes and support their food economies. Um, and then you can also start ingesting these foods yourself and um, start changing your own palate and your own, um, uh, you know, uh, food choices. Um, so also, you know, if you haven't um, prescribed to sort of a organic diet or eating local, that's another that's another way to start um, just as an individual level. Um, and sometimes it can seem like it's um, like it doesn't matter, um, you know, and plus we can be creatures of habit, but it does matter um, when you're at the grocery store. Um, if you can choose organic and non GMO, you should, um, because it's all about um, nourishing our bodies with the absolute best foods we possibly can. Um, and sometimes these foods are considerably higher priced, um, but you can look at it this way. You can either pay up front, you know, at the checkout, or you can either pay in years of your, off your life, or you can pay in health costs. Um, so it's better to sort of try to take care of, of your body now um, with your wallet, um, and know that you're investing in yourself and you're investing in your mind, your body and your spirit, because um, these, these plants um, are genetically sound. Um, and so you don't wanna eat things that are not created perfectly. Uh, I feel like that's the ultimate attainment um, or that's the ultimate goal for human beings is to evolve spiritually. Um, and it kills me because um, this world can convince us that uh, food is so scarce. You know, it's like um, everything is, you go to the grocery store and, you know, you get a little pack of blueberries for like $5.99. And it's like, uh, or, or you get like a bag of, you know, apples. And it's like, if anyone has ever seen an apple tree, it's so unbelievably abundant. Like we have so much waste. Um, that, that we just get rid of. Um, but there, there, are, there are ways that we can, um, you know, support local farms who are more affordable um, and who are right there in our backyards, or at least, um, you know, you're not getting food from different states, you're at least eating um, from where you are. Um, and so that's also another important aspect in the food sovereignty movement is, um, is these tribes uh, are trying to create large agricultural pro uh, projects because they want to, and they should eat from their own lands. Uh, they should be eating food that is grown in their own soil. So that way the minerals from that soil go into their bodies and then they become even deeper from where they are. Um, and like I had, uh, said in my introduction, you know, I'm, I'm Mashby. Um, I, I am Mashby Wampanoag. And so we don't necessarily separate ourselves from saying, you know, I am from, you know, I am Mashby and it, and it has been my goal to eat as indigenously and as locally as possible, you know, drinking the water, um, eating the shellfish and the fish, um, eating the local, um, you know, game, um, you know, eating what my ancestors ate essentially um, is what I'm trying to do because I want to know as deep as I can what being Mashpee is, you know? Um, and I feel like I can only do that if I have particles of Mashpee inside of me um, to speak to me, to, to help um, change and develop my, my muscles and my bones and my blood. Like 
that is how I look at food. Um, I look at it as like how I, how we can share each other's um, properties. So when you start to look at food that way, and I feel like that's probably how our ancestors looked at food um, because they had to literally source every level of food um, and they carefully um, sourced every level of food. I mean, when you're fishing or when you're hunting, um, sometimes you can be selective with the actual food, but um, for the most part, at least you're choosing where you're getting your, your food from. You know which waters it swam in or which woods it came from. You know, you know what your deer were eating, you know, things like that. Like, so it's, it's, it was like such a, um, a natural, uh, uh, concept to, to just know that you're eating not for taste, you're eating for like place. Um, so that to me, and that's the spiritual component, but that's, um, that's the one that speaks to me the most. And that's what we have to promote um, uh, as individuals and as tribal people and allies. Um, that's what we have to promote um, uh, as to why the food sovereignty movement is important. Um, so the other ways that you can um, become involved is, um, well, number one, knowing knowing your knowing where you are and whose land you're on, um, and and what these tribes are going through. I mean, education is key. Um, so I'm I'm here in uh, Mashpee, Massachusetts, of course, and and we're still dealing with um, assaults from the federal government on our lands, um, and it's been 400 years since contact, and we're still struggling to maintain our reservation lands so we can have agricultural projects so we can continue our aquaculture farms. Um, but it's just knowing what it is your tribe is still dealing with. And um, many of us can help by just offering our services or just um, if, if, you're, if the surrounding tribe has either a local business or even a tribal government or a, or a powwow or something like that, just go and support um, these tribal members um, because it's really, um, it's about um, economics and it's about finances and it's about uplifting our tribal people by supporting them with our dollars. It's about sharing, um, you know, it's about sharing, um, you know, uh, financially. Um, that's pretty much the only way that many of these uh, tribal people will, um, and tribal communities and economies will grow. Um, is if we share our own resources um, with these communities. Um, so let me think. Um, that's, that's my lens with the food sovereignty um, hat. And that's me speaking from my sustainable development background and my sustainable development degree. Um, as it was mentioned in the beginning, I'm also a student midwife and um, I'm a gallerist and, and it was, it felt for a little while that all of these um, desires within me were separate. Um, but most recently I found uh, there was a moment where midwifery and food sovereignty met and it blew my mind. And um, this again goes on to the spiritual component. Um, and it just like deepened my like belief um, in in the in this food. So, um, I, so putting on my midwifery hat, I um, I have three children. I gave birth at home. I've had water births, um, and I've done them all naturally. My last birth um, was in February, so ten months ago, um, and we had a free birth at home. And I spent a lot of time praying and just asking the creator to provide me with just um, answers as to who and what I should spiritually include in the space for giving birth. And um, right away through dreams, um, corn had shown up. And this is not the first time corn has shown up um, in the context of birth for me. And in all my research um, and all my discussions with other women um, and indigenous birth keepers, um, they've had different experiences with corn, but none similar to this. Um, 
so I, so all of a sudden I had these amazing dreams. Um, and one in particular was about the red, red corn. It was just red corn. And it told me to make a uh, red corn kernel bracelets. Um, and it was uh, it, or spirit was just saying, you know, red was, um, it was representing the blood, um, you know, within the birthing process. Um, and that corn is extremely fertile. It's both uh, masculine and feminine um, combined. Um, and if you just look at corn, and I do, I, I grow um, corn um, in a garden, and you know, I've I've been dealing with her and him, I guess, um, pretty intimately for the last maybe four or five years. Um, just like understanding what this plant is all about beyond me eating it, beyond recipes, like sort of like if it had a personality, like what would it be saying? You know, and, and we, we can understand it in the context of like the three sisters. Um, but I feel like that's one version of her expressed. Um, and, and so it was kind of interesting because in these dreams, it was saying like, you know, she's uh, number one, use this red corn um, for fertility, for anyone, give these bracelets for anyone or to anyone who is looking or, to, or seeking um, to become fertile and, um, and have them wear them and then have uh, place these bracelets. It was like, a I saw just like pictures of all of these corn bracelets just in my window and on my room surrounding me. And it was like, it was saying like, this is also for protection, like all the little corn sisters or, you know, beings just um, there like in the room. And so it was kind of cool because um, I wore one while I was, I was uh, delivering and I gave out a few and uh, you know, so far, everyone, uh, just two of the people that I've given out these bra bracelets to, they said that within, you know, a small amount of time, um, they, they did uh, conceive. And so I, I thought that was extremely um, amazing, because we don't often ask for these plant beings to accompany us in our day to day lives. Um, we only look at them as food you know, like I'm going to eat corn, what should we have for dinner? Or let's go grow out this corn so we can make flour or let's, grow, you know, let's make the corn cakes. But it's never about, you know, what, um, what personalities does um, bean have or what personality does uh, wild rice have or, uh, or anything else, you know? Um, and so that to me um, is, is something, is a moment where I was like, okay, it's not just about food. Um, these plants want to be listened to on a different level. And so part of my work too is about, is when I work with these tribes, you know, and every tribe has um, a plant or an animal that they really revere, that they have used historically for protection, for nourishment. And it's about evolving that, um, that, that understanding of that plant being and, and, and just asking questions as to how would that plant be, being uh, or animal be expressed in different contexts. Um, so that's sort of an interesting thing that hasn't uh, been done before um, and that's separate from the culinary food uh, use. Um, so when I think of food sovereignty, literally the words also have to be um, uh, re almost rearranged in a sense, or almost um, taken uh, literally. So it's like food and freedom. You know, this food has to be freed from commodification. So that's another level of the food sovereignty uh, context. Um, so those are just some different ways in which we can um, just understand our food systems and understand the food sovereignty movement. Um, so yeah, I, I do want to just um, I want to just take a moment and and if there are questions, I would love to answer questions or go deeper and in a different uh, area. If there, anyone wants to um, type in the chat, um, but I know we have um, some more time, but I do want it to be a little bit uh, interactive to an extent. 
Um, there's only uh, 12 of us on here. So I feel like we could have some pretty good conversations. Sure, I can, I will change the setting here now so people can unmute themselves. Um, if anybody has a question, you can feel free to unmute, come on video. I know some of you already are. Um, and ask questions if you have. Winter, go ahead. Yeah, I'm always piping up, right? <laughs> Thank you, Danielle. That was so beautiful. Like, hi, hi, Anushik. Really, really, you touched my heart. Um, Thank you. And I just was wondering, I'm guessing that you've seen the, that film Gather? I have. Beautiful film. Um, I, I'm briefly in it in the in the end. Um, That's you, right? I was trying to figure out like, is that her? That's so cool. That's so cool. So yeah, I just wanted to check in and make sure and just, you know, it's obviously so connected, right? And it's a really inspirational yeah. thing yes, that people movie, could see. Um, Thank you. Yeah, the movie Gather. If, if you have, if any of you have not seen it yet, it's it's brand new. Um, and First Nations Development Institute uh, co-produced it. Um, and basically, it um, goes through different tribes, um, tribal reservations, and just shows um, how these tribes are 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 working with um, their food systems. Um, for example, the Yurok youth, um, they are working to save their salmon and they call themselves the salmon people. And um, I had a chance to talk with them and they're literally in a food desert. Um, they have no grocery stores for like 90 miles, which is insane. Um, and many of them um, get their food from their gas stations um, because it's cheap and because it's just available. So they're surviving off of things like chips and um, you know, cookies and whatever else. And it's of course changing them. Um, it's stunting. I mean, eating chemical foods can do have a lot of detrimental effects to the body, to the mind. And it just breaks my heart that like this is happening to this tribe. And it's just to me, another way of genocide of, of killing, of trying to kill these people by just removing any access to food. And that's not uncommon. Um, that can be seen in the Pacific Northwest, that can be seen um, out in the Midwest. I mean, that like that is very common on tribal reservations. And a lot of these um, tribes don't have the economic uh, development resources or the capital to just even have their own food co-ops or have their own grocery stores. Um, so that's one way that, um, the, you know, we should be advocating and petitioning our senators, our, our representatives, whomever, these big companies, businesses to just flood in money specifically for access to food to tribal reservations. Um, but you can see the film on Amazon and um, just go to like gatherfilm.org and you can just download it or purchase it. But it's such a good film, beautifully produced. Um, and yeah, I was, the reason why they featured myself and the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe was because um, the Yurok tribe was the last tribe to be contacted. And we were the first tribe to be contacted. And here in 2020, um, or uh, that was what, 2019, we were still dealing with the same issues. Um, and so it's almost like nothing had changed. It didn't matter about time or contact. Um, we were still being assaulted in the same exact way. Um, and we were literally coast to coast because they're uh, way in California. And of course we're here on the East Coast. And it was just a really interesting uh, parallel to kind of talk about um, and, and just to meet one another, so. Yeah, it's a, it's a the film site itself is gather.film if anybody wants to go there. I noticed that they're also offering to do like community screenings if you reach out to them as well. So yeah, highly recommend it. I actually found it kind of intuitively. I was asked to be part of a panel and pick a film. And I just sort of started looking around and that one just jumped out at me. And then it was just like, it was such a beautiful film. It was, I was so glad, yeah, so. But so connected to obviously what you're talking about, right? The oh, issue definitely. Talking yeah. about. Yeah. definitely and then could you also 
give a little more feedback. I know you talked about this a little bit, but as you're speaking about, you know, food deserts and people in native communities not having access to healthy food. And then I'm also thinking about places back home in my own nation where people do have more access, but the indoctrination of even like what's traditional food, you know, people thinking that refined white flour, you know, like fry bread, perfect example, right? Like refined white flour, lard, deep fried is traditional. And like, pretty sure that's not what we were eating <laughs> pre-colonially, right? right? And then I look at like, well, every time I go home, I'm just struck by our young women are so beautiful, right? In every way, including physically. And then they'd be like 18 years old and there's so much things happening with their body that just speak to like poor nutrition. Mm -hmm. And yet they, they do act, they are able to get to a grocery store. It's, it's just that indoctrination of, right? Like there's so much room for education and obviously we all can participate in that. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, um, again, some, some of these are just, um, nostalgic, like habits passed down. Um, and I mean, okay. So for fry bread, yeah, we all love fry bread and it has a nostalgic place in native culture. I mean, it represents us. Um, it represents survival. Um, it represents us, um, you know, taking what we had, and what some tribes had um, yeah. and just using it and just, you know, consuming it and having it uh, be a part of your everyday cultural life. And it grew and you know what, it, it deserves a, a very special place in culture. Like it kind of was the glue to such fragmented uh, lost ways. You know, I mean, if, if you're displaced as a people and there's so such heavy levels of trauma you know, you're just, like, that was a way to rebuild some of their cultural ways. And that's so valid. Um, but now we're at a place on, where right? it can be, it can be put on the shelf um, and it can be acknowledged, but it shouldn't be defining who we are. Um, now, now that we do have access to certain, uh, to other foods and we're not in, the levels of poverty that maybe uh, our great grandparents were in. Now we can choose other things, you know, now we should choose other food products. And just like in the African American community, chitlins is brought out at like a very special time and it's just nostalgic. I mean, not many people are eating it day to day, but it did have a very special place in slave food culture. And it was one of those foods that was about survival and, you know, and it, and it, and it sustained them for generations, but it's not something that is good for you. It doesn't taste good, you know, and you have other choices. So it should be just put on the shelf and like remembered. <laughs> That's how I think we should now be um, looking at, at fry bread. Um, and, and there are chefs out there, um, um, uh, the sous chef, um, Sean Sherman has a wonderful cookbook out there um, where he's using, you know, healthier flowers and making breads, um, you know, so there's other inspiration that's happening. But the other piece that's very real is that a lot of people don't know how to cook. And they don't know how even so when I was out, um, you know, working for a, a Midwest tribe whom I love, um, we had community gardens, but many of the people didn't even utilize or pick the produce that was in the community gardens in, you know, the, um, the tribal housing developments, um, because it was easier to go out of habit to the grocery store, buy the things that you're used to or are, are on sale, but they might not know like what to do with the eggplant that we grew or what to do with the okra that we grew um, or just different you know levels of preparation. So on a very practical level, there has to be cooking classes. You know, um, there have to be 
Um, we have to literally reteach ourselves our, and, and create new food culture. Um, so that's something that um, we all can help do and promote. It's like a remembering, right? Definitely. Like a, even the thing about the fry bread, it's like when I think about fry bread, I think, well, yeah, it, it was a, a, a case of like adaptability, you know, back home that, that those supplies come from basically getting rations from the Indian agent, like that's all you were given. So I, I've always been um, curious to know because it seems to me it's like, so that would, fry, the equivalent of fry bread would have been made out of whole flowers from other more nutritious plants prior. It was just our people like using what they had. And in that way, it would have been a continuation of our traditions but people have forgotten a lot of people that that's what that is, right? That this is not what we've always eaten and it's not healthy, right? And then the other thing that you just mentioned, you know, like a lot of that um, gas station food, it's addictive, right? It's addictive, all that sugar. And so it's also like navigating that right I think acknowledging that that food is addictive definitely the process of putting healthier practices in place you know oh definitely definitely that yeah that's such a good um point that I didn't even touch upon but it's very real um the addiction and I I think I have been using the word habit but it's like addiction is like uh you know, an internal chemical response. So it's yeah. not like a habit that maybe you can like trick your mind into. So yes, uh, uh, yeah, these are chemical foods that um, are just taking control of the brain and rewiring the brain and our responses. And even if that's also part of the struggle. I mean, even if we do do certain levels of education, it's about breaking that addiction, you know? Yeah. Beautiful, thank you. Very thought provoking. Thanks for that, Winter. Does anyone else have uh, questions? Oh, that was my video. <laughs> anyone else on the Zoom call um, have questions. Um, I'm just going to check YouTube real quick. And we did have someone who asked what was that website? Um, and specifically, it was uh, that you mentioned the site that was able to purchase a native grown food, native grown foods as a way of supporting communities. So I just want to make sure I get it correct. Um, Indian, sorry, Indian ag dot org. Yeah. Indian I N D I. Great. Got it. I'm going to link that. I'll put oh. that in the chat here on Zoom too. Excuse me while I go do that on YouTube. Yeah, indianag.org. And so it's um, it's pretty updated. Um, and I, I order from there all the time. Um, and another thing that you can also sort of put on your radar and be involved in are once sort of COVID um, goes away, um, there are many food sovereignty um, seminars and food sovereignty workshops um, that are usually sponsored by different tribes. And it is um, um, put on by the intertribal Agriculture Council, um, and they um, are amazing. Um, they also have uh, they have American Indian food programs. Um, they connect you with different uh, producers. Um, if you're looking to build your your business, or if you're looking to market a particular product, um, or even if you're looking to just get started, they also have grant resources. And this is the Intertribal Agriculture Council. And this is also how I got interested in the food, the foods of the food sovereignty movement, uh, because they invite chefs from all over the country to um, cook for you 
um, you know, for all the participants for, and usually the, the, um, the workshops are about a week long. So your breakfast, your lunch, and your dinners are all indigenous foods cooked by different um, indigenous chefs. And that was amazing because I mean, I, um, I was having like buffalo tongue and, you know, bison burgers and, you know, grilled drew, um, sunchokes with wild rice. And so that's one way that was like a crash course in just like changing your palate and just experiencing these different foods. And like we've said a few times, remembering, you know, the genetic memory of these foods. And also there's tons of workshops, um, on food, on seed saving, um, there's seed swaps, um, there's all sorts of fun stuff. And they have, um, they just had a virtual um, conference, um, but hopefully, you know, um, they'll have more, but I would definitely check them out um, at the Intertribal Agriculture, Agriculture Council. What would you suggest for people living in a city? solutions for urban urban food growing? Um, that's a great question. I mean, maybe on an individual level, if you have access um, to your own outdoors, um, growing foods in containers or on your patio or on the rooftops. Um, I mean, I used to live in um, Manhattan for many, many years, as well as DC. And um, I try to utilize my outside space with at least growing some herbs, um, you know, at least getting your green thumb wet. Um, and then also definitely participating in the um, uh, farmers markets. There's always so many farmers markets that usually um, are, are, you know, filled with food producers from the outskirts of the city and farms um, from the outskirts. So that's one way to definitely get um, some fresh local produce for sure. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for pointing out that question. It's curious as someone living in an urban center, how to do that. But I do want to point to the chat box. There are two interesting questions just simmering back there, one from Tatiana and one from Mohammed. Okay, so Tatiana is asking, what got you into food sovereignty? Were there any specific moments or something more organic. Um, so uh, growing up here in Mashpee, my mother um, would always, just even in our own backyard, um, she would always point out to me edible plants, um, like the boxberry or winterberry, um, just some, even some just weeds that I, I don't even know the names of, but we would always just be walking around the yard eating stuff or picking blueberries. And so and that was at a very young age. And that, that just opened up my mind before the door was even closed um, that, you know, out, I can eat what is growing around me. You know, like it's not just there. Like I don't just live amongst it. And so that has always been with me. And then um, growing up in our tribal community, you know, I grew up, you know, fishing, um, eating the local shellfish, um, many of our, our tribal men um, hunt. Uh, my uncles always hunted, so we would always have deer meat and access to um, those sort of wild food and wild game, you know, turkey hunting and rabbit hunting. So um, eating, eating from just my, just from Mashpee was always something that I did. And then as I got older, I sort of was just consumed into mainstream society. Um, but then it wasn't until, um, I don't know, I, I just started, I just wanted to be healthier. I like, I just wanted to be, um, um, clearer. I think I was going, I was starting my own spiritual questioning and evolution. And I always just had turned to nature to provide those answers. Um, so I just followed the plants and the animals and their teachings and their readings. Um, and so that's sort of, uh, I've just stuck with that. Um, and so it, it was less about food. It was more about um, like the plants and the animals. And then it was like, oh, okay, now let me take that another step further and eat them. And like, so not just learn about them, 
um, or use them um, just if you're sick or just for medicine, but it should just be like preventative, just every day, always trying to dig deeper into like what you should just be eating um, and what my ancestors ate. Um, I also had tried a bunch of different diets, just um, not like for like weight loss or anything, but just kind of playing around like, well, what's vegetarianism all about? Or what's veganism all about? Like, why should I omit dairy? Like, should I not be eating meat? You know, like I just had those questions because I felt like there's so much confusion about food in mainstream society. Like literally one year it's like, don't eat tomatoes, they're bad for you. And then the next year it's like, tomatoes are the best thing for you. You have to eat them every day. And it's like, and I kind of caught on to that. And I'm like, wait a minute. I thought that, you know, this was bad for my cholesterol. Now it's good. So I was like, okay, I don't even know what to believe. I'm just going to go to my ancestors because, you know, I trust what they were eating. I trust what they were doing locally. And now I just eat what they eat and I eat in moderation. And, you know, and, and that's that. Cause I, I don't know what to believe, <laughs> you know, through mainstream uh, medicine or science, like I, or Western science. I just, I, I've, I've brushed that off, you know? Um, and then, you know, I just, I just started that as a career, um, um, because it's something that I'm passionate about. So, um, so that's, that's how that came about. <laughs> um, I hope that was, that was clear. And then I see another question, um, by Muhammad. Um, he says, I'm curious about water systems and the role this plays in perpetuating cultural degradation, particularly in remote communities. To what extent is the lack of clean water access restricting food sovereignty? Um, I mean, water is life, you know, without clean water, like what do you have? I mean, you have you could have food, but it's not going to be at um, the best nutritional level. Um, some of these um, communities that don't have water access are now being are prevented from having large scale agricultural projects because they can't water these plants that they're either growing in hoop houses or in greenhouses, for example. Um, so that's, that's out the door. Um, so in a lot of these communities, um, they don't even have access to the water, it has to get, you know, shipped in or trucked in. Um, so they don't even have the infrastructure for um, these, you know, for water capacity to provide their communities just for drinking or just for cooking, never mind, um, you know, agricultural uh, initiatives. So that to me um, can be, that can be combated um, on one level with the food, uh, excuse me, with the rights of nature. Um, they can find their water source. Um, for example, um, is it the Colorado Indian River? Uh, so a lot of these tribes are banding together and they're sourcing their main, main water supply and they're, they're, uh, they're collaborating on its protection and saying that this water source has a right to be clean. It doesn't, you know, it has a right to be not polluted. It has a right, um, you know, it's alive. It provides, um, it provides life for other sources of, you know, fish and, and not just humans, but um, it should be protected um, because um, mainstream is not doing that. You know, um, there's like water cleanups and, you know, there's preventing um, pipelines, but there's not actually um, saying that this body of water cannot be obstructed um, um, that will harm its natural way of being. And that is something that's being challenged um, through the rights of nature. I would, I would encourage all of us to do some more research on rights of nature and encourage us to legally protect our waterways. I hope, I hope that helped you, Mohammed. Yeah, that's so interesting. I actually have a question on that because I do feel like I've heard people talk about food sovereignty from like a political aspect. I've heard it talked about from like a health aspect. I feel like um, 
the that the right the right of nature is something that's new to me which is so exciting and i also feel like you bring spirituality to the conversation and i was wondering how you navigate those intersections specifically between like policy and and something that is more spiritual or or not as like founded in legal terminology if that makes sense well that's what um that is what the right of nature is doing. I mean, for the first time, it's actually um, putting the spiritual component first, and it's and it's um, it's validating it. I don't think that has been done anywhere, um, especially with a non-human being. Um, so it's definitely and it's. But I think our society at a whole is ready for that. I I, um, I think collectively all of us whether you're native or non-native has reached different levels of spiritual um consensus that's why i think that's it's it's um able to pass right now you know generations ago probably not but now i think people are catching on and they're unfortunately because things are at almost its worst <laughs> which is horrible um but I, I, I am, all of us believe in spirituality, whatever you decide to call it. I think it's nice that um, we're calling it out and we're, and we're acknowledging it in this form um, legally because you can't deny it. Um, you know, we can debate on what it's called, you know, the different names within different religions or belief systems, but it, it exists. Um, and, and consciousness in water has been proven um, even in Western science with Dr. Uh, Mazimoto, uh, the, the amazing doctor who passed, but, um, you know, where he prayed and him and a group of monks had um, um, meditated on water and it changed the molecular uh, constitution of, of the water. And it was a direct connection with prayer and intention and uh, the, the molecules. And so on a scientific level, that's science, but on a spiritual level, it's like, yeah, okay. It has consciousness and it's being affected by your, your, your spirit that you're giving it, that you're, that you're, uh, transferring to the water. Um, and so now, now I feel like we all can move forward with the rights of nature movement. It's just about equipping tribes and non-tribal people with the education so we all can just adopt it and recognize it and evolve the movement. I hope that helps. <laughs> that um, your question, Emily. <laughs> That was wonderful. Yes. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, I will definitely have to research more into that. I'm very excited. Great. Um, oh, go ahead, Daniel. I was just going to say we're getting close to time. I just wanted to be yeah. mindful of your time. Um, there's, sure. oh, are you reading the, there's a yeah, big I was just comment in the chat. Yeah. Any more um, questions? Do you see any that I might have missed? I don't think so. I think. Um, okay. Oh, Tatiana. wait, no, Tatiana did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my my critiques of what are my critiques of mainstream food sovereignty um, as an indigenous perspective? Um, I just feel like it's um, it's slow moving. It's a little bit stagnant right now, um, and I think the only reason why is because people are not believing it and giving it the energy that it needs. I feel like it has. It's convincing. Um, the facts are there, like we got the research behind it, there's money behind it with grants, but it's like people, it's like, I don't know if it's not popular or it's not, um, I don't really know what's, what's, um, what is the problem. Maybe it's money. Maybe, um, maybe there has to be more money infused into these tribal economies for things to move forward um, because maybe just belief isn't enough, you know. Um, maybe they do need um, more money to buy, to literally just practically buy different groceries, or maybe they need um, different businesses to buy, you know, certain, you know, other foods. Um, 
or just have access to different seeds to grow or soil or water, things like that. So I do think it's stagnant. Um, that's just my only critique, um, but it's because I'm excited about it and I want it to move. Um, so, but I'm, I'm optimistic and I'm, and I'm pretty um, satisfied with where it's, it's gone, uh, to be honest. Um, and there's a great, there's a good core group of people out there advocating for the food sovereignty movement. Um, but yeah, I, I can't talk too bad about it. <laughs> so, um, okay. That was all the questions, but then there was Jamie um, left a, okay. <laughs> a very thorough comment there if you had a chance oh, to great. see it. Thank you, Jamie. Um, yeah. So yeah, um, I hope that helped um, with everyone's just understanding. I hope I, I left you with just some things to think about in different ways um, to just understand food sovereignty. Um, if you can definitely just support these tribes and their food related businesses and start there. Um, definitely just educate yourself on, on the tribe that surrounds you, you know, you and, and just the issues that they're going through. Um, and what they're doing. Um, and then, yeah, just share the movement, you know. That's great. Um, there's just one comment. Also, I'll just read um, the St. Sarah who was asking about the website earlier. She said, this has been a phenomenal presentation, inspirational and soul nourishing. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, I Thank you. Can I just ask real quick, Danielle, I just found your uh, training post and gallery online. Can oh, yeah. we post the URL for that so that we can see yes, more of please. where you are situated right now? Yes, definitely. You want to um, type it in? I was trying, but it was just too difficult on my iPhone. Yeah. It's Wampanoag Trading Post and Gallery.com. Um, I put it, oh, I just, I meant to put it to everybody. It's like my default is Emily. Sorry. <laughs> I'll do it again. Um, let me put it in there, post and gallery. Because you got some really lovely things up there on online too, so. Yes, thank you. We're on Facebook, we're on Instagram, we have a website. We just opened in July. Um, the last uh, time that there was any um, native business presence in Mashpee in the form of like a trading post was like in maybe the 50s. Um, so people, although we opened during COVID, we've been successful because, um, people are, have been looking for authentic Native American, um, especially Mashpee Wampanoag and Eastern Woodlands, just, um, art. And it's also been a beautiful blessing because, um, I feel like in, as an Indigenous person, we can get so bogged down with the many burdens that we are have faced historically and are still facing. So you can kind of feel like everyone's against you or, or like, oh, you know, you know, oh, the white people or oh, this or oh, that. And like always blaming the man or something. But it's a really nice breath of fresh air because people are always from all different backgrounds, ethnicities, races, ages. They come into the store and they're just genuinely interested in the tribe or what's happening within Indian country, or it gives them an opportunity to ask certain questions or say like, oh yeah, I grew up with a Wampanoag guy or, oh, my grandmother this, or, you know, like everybody has a story and um, it helps remind us that like, oh, we do have supporters and allies and we as native people should actually ask for help. Um, ask for support. Like we are not alone. You know, when you live on the reservation or in a bubble, you can think that you're alone, but um, there are good people out there who are willing um, and able to help. You know, we just have to ask um, and just, because, you know, oftentimes non-natives feel like, like um, they feel like they don't want to impose or they don't want to like, um, you know, overstep their boundaries or, you know, um, they're not going to offer their services because they don't want to be looked at like, oh, you're not a charity case. Like there's like all these sort of stigmas in non-native um, people in their minds um, that prevent them from helping. 
Um, so that's just something that we're learning here is that people want to help and, and they want to support and they want to uplift tribes. You know, not everyone um, has the mindset of like our former president, for example, like there's good people out there. So, so yeah, please check us out um, and support. Um, one thing that we're still dealing with um, on my website, heronhill.org, um, on some of my blog posts, um, the Mastery Wampanoag Tribe is still fighting and petitioning for our 321 acres of reservation lands that was taken away um, by the Trump administration. That has never happened before um, in history. And it was literally just um, to stop us from our gaming efforts uh, because it would have been in competition with some of the other uh, deep pockets around. So we're still fighting for that. Um, 2020 marks the 400th anniversary of the arrival of the Mayflower. Um, and so some people are celebrating that. We're still, um, you know, calling it just the 400th year of resistance. Um, and, and we're hoping just to get our story out there um, that, that we're still here, you know, and, and we fed the pilgrims. <laughs> you know, it was the Wampanoags that fed the pilgrims. So we've been exercising our food sovereignty for a long time now, you know, and we deserve, we deserve land um, and resources too, you know, so we can survive too. So um, I just wanna thank you guys for your support um, and just listening and I'm available um, via email and Facebook if anybody wants to talk further or collaborate or, or whatever. So thank you guys so much. Awesome, hi, hi, thank you, Danielle. And thank you everyone for joining us this evening. We have more events tomorrow starting up again. We have a private um, opening blessing, um, similar to what we did today, um, but tomorrow it'll be with Joan Henry, a longtime community member, and various other panels throughout the day. We will have a musical performance by Jennifer Kreisberg, um, a presentation on Native women and cancer, and a panel on Indigenous midwifery, um, an Indigenous midwifery and doula panel. Um, and then uh, to close out, we will have a private presentation on uh, rites of passage ceremony by Louise McDonald Hearn. Um, but the doula panel, the cancer presentation and the musical performance will be public and streamed on YouTube again. Um, yeah, so with that, I will pass it to Emily to uh, close us out. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you, Danielle. I don't know about all of you, but I definitely have a million notes uh, and tabs open. Just very excited. Um, but anyways, thank you for joining us for this wonderful event. Uh, we invite you to please consider a donation by going to AICH.org forward slash donate. We are a grassroots organization and your donations are what enable programming like this for our community to occur. And I know I really enjoyed it and I hope you all did too. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you.